a child, kindergarten, or uh, up into youth ministry, uh, and you, they still want to go to Camp Siloam this summer for, uh, for summer camp, then we need to know that by tomorrow. They have to be registered by tomorrow. Uh, this evening, uh, in honor of Mother's Day, there will be no, uh, no, evening, uh, no evening worship. So uh, you can come tonight, but uh, there won't be anybody here. Um, and then, then third and finally, uh, we have begun uh, this, this new thing called e-giving. Anybody ever heard of e-giving? Pay bills that way or anything? We, we started e-giving here at the church, so if you would like to see a little bit more about that, go to elmdale.org slash, uh, slash giving or slash give and, uh, and, and check that out. Uh, and then if you've got any other questions, if you're looking for any other announcements, be sure to check out the bulletin and check out the website, elmdale.org. O-R-G. Um, you'll notice uh, Brother Brad normally is up here giving the announcements today, but his, uh, his father-in-law, his, his wife Mary's dad, passed away this, uh, this week. So would in- ask you to be in prayer for, uh, for the Vaughns and for their, their family. Brad will be preaching at that, his funeral uh, here in the next couple days. So pray for Brad and for Mary and their kids. Um, do want to welcome you here today to Elmdale Baptist. Uh, it's always exciting uh, on, on Mother's Day because there's so many uh, new faces, so many family members that come, come to be, uh, be with family on special days like this. So we're just excited you're here. But if you are a first-time guest with us today, we ask that you fill take one of those connection cards in the back of that pew that's in front of you, fill that out and drop it in the offering plate as it comes by here just a little bit later in the service. As of right now, though, let's take a few moments. We're going to greet one another. Stand with us. We'll greet a few people around us, and we'll begin our time of worship. Still with the Spirit of God, we are one in the bond of love. We are one in the bond of love. Spirit of God, we are one in the bond of love. Let's sing it one more time. We are one in the bond of love. We are one in the bond of love. We have joined our spirit with the Spirit of God. We are one in the... Let's sing it one more time together. We are one in the bond of love. We are one the bond of love we have joined our spirit with the spirit of God we are one in the bond of love y'all may be seated at this time we have a very special uh, presentation by our mini minstrel choir it's directed by Regina McRae and Debbie Ray y'all give them a hand really quick kind of relax them a little bit
Amen. We are, as usual, excited um, on, on Mother's Day. Um, I'd like to ask right now, if you are here today and you are a mother, would you please stand? And stay standing, yes. Keep standing. Keep standing. All right. All right. Now, if you're here today and you have a mother, please stand. No, seriously, seriously. We're going to stand for worshiping anyways. If you're still sitting down, whether she's ever been alive or she's still alive, it, 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 I want you to, to stand. This is, this is great news because this means you have something to celebrate today. You are who you are today. Good, bad, or indifferent because God gave you a mom. So I want to pray for you mothers right now, and then we're going to begin with our time of worship. And listen, at the end of the service, you're also going to receive a, a gift. So let's go before the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you so much for this morning. You are an awesome, awesome God. Thank you so much for your son, Jesus. Thank you for his death on the cross. Thank you for his resurrection from the dead. Lord, this morning we celebrate the gift of mothers that you've given to us. God, for those of us, those who are with us today who have mothers who have gone to, to be with the Lord, God, we thank you for the legacy that they've left behind. For those of us who, uh, who still have mothers that we can call and we can just tell them how much we love them and appreciate them, God, would you just give us, give us the strength to do that, Father? God, for those who are here today who, uh, who are mothers, God, we thank you for them. We thank you for what they mean to us, they, what they mean to our families, what they mean to who we are, and what they mean to our church. And God, we thank you for every woman who is here. Because we know whether, whether the, any woman here has children or not, you have given them the heart of a mother, and we need mamas. God, thank you so much for blessing us with the mothers that you've given to us. God, we praise you, we exalt you, God, for you are worthy. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray, amen. Would you remain standing while we worship? We come into your presence We remember every blessing That you poured out so freely from above Lifting gratitude and praises For compassion so amazing Lord, we come to give you thanks For all you've done Come on church, let's sing it because of your love, we're forgiven. Because of your love, our hearts are clean. And we lift you up with songs of freedom. Forever we're true. Because of your love. As we come into your presence, we remember every blessing that you poured out so freely from above. Living gratitude and praises for compassion so amazing. For we come to give you thanks for all you've done. Because of your love, we're forgiven. Because of your love, our hearts are clean. And we lift you up with songs of freedom. Forever we change because of your love. Sing the chorus again. Because of your love, we're forgiven. Because of your love, our hearts are clean. And we lift you up with songs of freedom. Forever we're changed 
because of your love. We're here because of his love, and we're here to glorify the name of Jesus. Father, we love you, we worship and By your name in all the earth. Glorify your name. Glorify your name. Glorify your name in all the We love you, we worship and adore you, glorify your name in all the earth, glorify your name, glorify your name.
glory today. All right, amen and amen. Glory in the highest. Precious God, our precious Lord. In the quiet, in the stillness, I know that you are God in the secret of your presence I know there I am restored when you call I won't refuse each new day again I'll choose There is no one else for me None but Jesus Crucified to set me free Now I live In the chaos, in the fusion, I know you're sovereign still. In the moment of my weakness, you me grace to do your will. When you fall, I won't delay. This my song through all my days. There is no one else for me, none but Jesus, crucified to set me free. Now I live to give Him praise. Give the chorus again. There is no one else for me. None but Jesus. Crucified to save me free. Now I live to give Him praise. open your Bible to Mark chapter 3. 
Mark chapter 3 and then remain standing. Mark chapter 3. I'm going to begin in verse 1. God's Word says in Mark chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, Now he entered the synagogue again, and a man was there who had a paralyzed hand. In order to accuse him, they were watching him closely to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath. He told the man with the paralyzed hand, Stand before us. Then he said to them, Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do what is good or to do what is evil, to save life? Or to kill. But they were silent. After looking around at them with anger and sorrow at the hardness of their hearts, he told the man, Stretch out your hand. So he stretched it out, and his hand was restored. Immediately the Pharisees went out and started plotting with the Herodians against him how they might destroy him. Jesus departed with his disciples to the sea. And a large crowd followed from Galilee, Judea, Jerusalem, Idumea, beyond the Jordan and around Tyre and Sidon. The large crowd came to him because they heard about everything he was doing. Then he told his disciples to have a small boat ready for him so the crowd would not crush him. Since he had healed healed many, all who had diseases were pressing toward him to touch him. Whenever the unclean spirits saw him, those possessed fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. And he would would strongly warn them not to make him known. Then he went up the mountain and summoned those he wanted. And they came to him. He also appointed twelve. He also named them apostles to be with him, to send them out to preach, and to have authority to drive out demons. He appointed the twelve. To Simon he gave the name Peter. And to James, the son of Zebedee, and to his brother John, he gave the name Boanerges, that is, sons of thunder. Andrew, Philip and Bartholomew, Matthew and Thomas, James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Father, we praise you today. We thank you for your word. Thank you for its truth, God, for its power. Thank you, Lord, that it's like a hammer, that it's ready to pulverize uh, hard hearts. God, we thank you, Lord, that you are our shepherd, and we ask you to speak to us today through your word. And it's in the mighty and awesome name of Jesus we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Can we just admit something here today as we get started? None of us would be here without our mothers. Now, there is the whole birth thing. That's, that's important. But it's more than that. I mean, uh, think about potty training. Now, I guarantee you, most of, for most of us, it was our mamas that did the potty training, right? Not, not, only, not only those things. If it weren't, if it weren't for our moms, uh, many of us wouldn't have eaten growing up. Uh, I know in my house, my kids would have gotten really fat on pancakes and, uh, and, and waffles if, if, if I would have been doing all the, the cooking. And for me personally, it was the vegetables that my mom made sure that I ate, uh, broccoli in particular. But uh, what would we, where would we be without our moms who were there? Where would we be without our moms who, let's face it, are really the ones in the, in the homes that show the most compassion? I mean, it's never been, it never turned out well for my kids when they came to me feeling sick, wanting to stay home from school, because I'd say, suck it up and go to school. Now, mom was a little bit, a little bit different. Mom, well, she has compassion. She has love. She has that caring heart. Where would we be? Where would we be without mom? I think we could say the same thing about Jesus. Jesus. Not the fact that Jesus makes, our, makes us eat our vegetables. He gave us mom for that, right? But where would we be without Jesus? Where would we be today if Jesus hadn't been there to show us com- compassion and love? Thing about it, the thing about us with our moms is we haven't always showed our moms the, 
the love that they deserve to be showed, have we? Our, our attitudes, you know, growing up, I even look back at, at my relationship with my own mom. My attitude wasn't always really good towards my mom. And I'm, and I'm sure many of you can say the same thing. And I think we can relate that to, to our relationship with Jesus. Our attitudes aren't always that good towards Jesus either. And so what we've been doing, we've been going through the, the Gospel of Mark and the Gospel of Mark is one of the first accounts of, uh, written of Jesus' life. Uh, Mark uh, wasn't actually one of Jesus' original 12 disciples, in fact, or one of his original disciples. In fact, Mark was a disciple of one of Jesus' disciples. He was a disciple of Peter. So when you read the Gospel of Mark and you look at the stories and you look at the things that, that Mark uh, tells us about in Jesus' life, you're looking really at what, it, it, from Peter's eye view, of Mark's life. The word gospel means good news. So anytime you read the gospel of Mark, you're reading about the good news of Jesus Christ. Anytime you read Matthew, Luke, or John, you're reading about the good news of Jesus Christ. In Mark chapter 1, verse 15, Jesus, where Mark tells us what Jesus' message is, where Jesus says this. He says, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God has come near. So he says, repent and believe the good news. You see, what Mark is doing is he's showing us through his gospel that Jesus is the Son of God. And he tells us how to respond to Jesus. So in our scripture that we read today in those 19 verses, here's what we learn. Here's what Mark reveals to us. Mark reveals to us three attitudes that people had when they followed Jesus. And I believe that, that if you want to apply that to our lives today, I believe that every single one of us will have one of these three attitudes in our lives. And it, and it may not be a, a total picture of all the attitudes, but I'll bet you that, that every single one of us at some point in our week are going to fit into one of these three categories. So let's just look at what the Word says. The first attitude that, uh, that Mark tells us about is the attitude of the hard heart. In verse 5, it says that Jesus looked at the religion leaders and when he looked at them it says he looked at them with anger now can you imagine there's not many places in the new testament or in the in the gospels that tell us about jesus being being angry just a handful of places where you see jesus really getting upset but yet right here we we see it says that jesus got angry and then it says that he was grieved why because he saw their hard hearts. And so you've got these, these men, they're the Pharisees, they're the religious leaders of the, Jewish, of the Jewish world. And here's what it tells about us. In verse two, it tells us that they came to Jesus to accuse him. If you remember in Mark chapter two, we see that Jesus wasn't, wasn't afraid to, to, rub, uh, to rub against what the Pharisees and what the religious people of the day taught. He wasn't afraid to stand against the traditions and the things of the, that the Pharisees were teaching and the religious establishment had taught that day. And so because it got so bad, what they, they wanted to do, these religious leaders, they wanted to find a reason to accuse Jesus. So then in verse two, it also tells us this. It tells us that they watched him closely. They watched him closely closely. They're looking for anything they can find to accuse Jesus with. They wanted, and in particular, what they wanted to find out today is, or on this occasion, is he going to heal on the Sabbath? Now, let's just stop for a second and think about the Sabbath. Because, because what can really be that big of a deal about healing on the Sabbath? Well, the Pharisees and the religious leaders followed a set of strict traditions. In fact, they had, they had this writing called the Jewish Talmud. And in that writing, what the, what the rabbis had done in years past is they had gone through and they had set up all kinds of rules and all kinds of applications to the laws in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, there's 613 laws. Well, these, these rabbis were so concerned that, that the Old Testament wasn't clear enough that they went in and they made, they made all their own sets of rules just to be sure that they wouldn't accidentally break one of God's laws. 
Now their, their hearts, I think, were in the right place. They really, when they first did this, they really wanted to honor God. Well, on, in terms of the Sabbath day, You can check that out in Exodus chapter 20, I think around verse 10. And in terms of the Sabbath day, it basically said this. It said, there shall be no working on the the Sabbath day. And so what they did is they came up with some rules. In fact, they spent 24 chapters in this book creating rules for the Sabbath. So let me just give you a couple of those rules. Like for example, You were, according to the Talmud, those rabbis said traveling more than 3,000 feet from your home was prohibited unless somebody placed some food at the 3,000 foot point, then they could go to that point and they could take 3,000 more feet. Not making this up. This is is some of the rules that they had. Something that they would also, one of the rules was this, something that was picked up in a public place could not be set down in a private place. Or I'm sorry, could only be set down in a private place. So if I wanted to, I guess, pick up my Bible here in a public place, I couldn't set it down until I go back to my office. Well, why? Well, that could be considered work. I mean, that Bible is heavy. Or it was forbidden for anyone to carry anything heavier. Okay, get this. It was forbidden for anyone to carry anything heavier than a dried fig. Okay. Well, we just want to be sure that we don't do anything to disobey God on the Sabbath. And so what these guys did, what these, what these Pharisees were doing is they, were, they had followed those, relig- those, uh, those traditions so closely and so strongly. They didn't, want, they didn't want to see Jesus break any of those. They didn't want to see Jesus break any of those traditions. Now let's, let's just stop for a moment. I don't want to chase this rabbit too far, but I think it's important for us to talk about, to talk about this. How should a Christian relate to the Sabbath? I mean, what, what does the Sabbath have to do with us as followers of Jesus? Now, we're not Jews, right? So that means that we're not under the Old Testament law. But yet, what we, we often call Sunday a Christian Sabbath. Well, we need to understand a couple of things about the Sabbath in in the Old Testament. The Sabbath in the Old Testament's first and major function was a day of rest. It happened happened from, from sundown on Friday evening to sundown on Saturday evening. It was a time in which God told his people to rest. One of the ways that they were set apart in that day was that they would rest one day out of the week. They would take this this one day and they'd say, this day, we're not going to do any work. And they followed God's example, God's example, because even God did that on the seventh day of, of creation. Even God took a Sabbath day, a day of rest. But for us, the Bible says in, in Matthew chapter five, that Jesus came to fulfill the law. You see, what that means for us is that means that Jesus is our Sabbath. We have eternal rest in Jesus Christ. We have spiritual rest in Jesus Christ. But let me me say two things with that. There's also two other principles that are taught in the New Testament. Even commands. The first principle is this. It's the principle of rest. Listen, if you go weeks upon weeks without taking any real time to rest, you're going to hurt yourself. So God has, God has given us a principle. We have to take time for rest. We need sleep. We need to take time off. If all we ever do is work, if all we're ever doing is going, if we never take time to, to rest and enjoy life, Even as Christians, we become hard people to be around. 
In fact, I'm, I'd, I'd say I'm, pretty, uh, I'm a pretty easygoing guy. I'm, I'm in a good mood a lot of the time. But if you ever catch me when I'm in a bad mood, it's probably got a lot to do because I'm tired. And I think the same could be said for every single one of us. The second thing is this. Not only has God given us a call and a principle to take, take time to rest in our lives, God has also called us to worship. God has also commanded us to worship. He's called us to not, let the, not to forsake our assembling together to worship. Not, not to let go of the coming together to worship together. Once a week is an important thing for us. If we're as followers of Jesus, if we want to be faithful to follow Jesus, we can't, we've got to do it with brothers and sisters in Christ. Now here's the deal. You cannot love Jesus and not love his wife. You can, you you couldn't, when you asked me to come here, you didn't just get me and say, but you can't bring your wife with you. In fact, looking back, most of you would probably have had my wife than you've had, would have me. But you can't do that. Why? Because me and my wife, well, we're a package. We come together. You see, the same is true for the church. You can't have Jesus without having the body of Christ, without having the bride of Christ. And God has called us to to worship together and to do it consistently and to do it regularly. Next thing we find out is that they remain silent. When Jesus asked them this question, Jesus said, "Let, let me ask you guys something. Is it okay Is it better to give life or to take life on the Sabbath? Is it better to do what's good or to do what's evil on the Sabbath day? And of course, the the Pharisees and those, those religious leaders, it says they just stayed silent. And at that point, Jesus got angry because he knew that they refused to admit what they knew to be true. And we know that they were hard-hearted because they conspired against Jesus. These guys were focused on their own agenda and they missed this opportunity for compassion. They were so concerned about keeping their traditions. They were so concerned about finding, finding Jesus doing something he wasn't supposed to do that they didn't even see when there was a man who was in deep and desperate need right next to him. Now, when we talk about the Pharisees, if you've been in church for a long time, if you've not been in church for a long time, this may not be, be said of you, but if you've been in church for a long time and you hear something about the Pharisees, here's what you, here's what you normally think about when you think about the Pharisees. You think about religious people who who are hard-headed, but you never, ever, ever, I mean, you get them in a negative light because that's the light that we get them in in the New Testament. But I'll tell you what you don't think about when you think about the Pharisees. You don't think about yourself. But I'm here to tell you that we have just as much a problem today being hard-headed as our Pharisee, as the Pharisees did, as being hard-hearted, I should say. Did I say hard-headed? I meant hard-hearted. We have just as much a problem with being hard-hearted as the Pharisees had in in our day. And does anybody remember uh, back, I think it was in the 90s now, uh, back in the 90s, uh, Jeff Foxworthy had this thing, you might be a redneck. Raise your hand if you remember that. All right. Uh, Well, I just thought I'd give you a couple of them. Like, for example, you might be a redneck if Thanksgiving is ruined because you ran out of ketchup. (laughs) I might be a redneck. Um... You might be a redneck if you've ever had to wait to use the toilet but because the dog was drinking from it. Uh-huh. You might be a redneck if the last words to the star Sp- if you think the last words to the Star Spangled Banner are play ball. And then finally, you might be a redneck if uh, if your boat has not left the driveway in 15 years. Some people that'll hit home for. But Let me try something different. 
Because, because when we think about this, when we think about being hard-hearted, we don't automatically look at ourselves. So let's just, let's just try this. Let's play this other, this other thing. This, not, this isn't gonna be very funny, but I think it'll be helpful. You might be hard-hearted. You might be hard-hearted if you leave the church thinking more about the songs we sang than the Savior we sang about. You might be hard-hearted if you spend all your time being taught rather than teaching others. You might be hard-hearted if you think your way of doing things is the only way of doing things. You might be hard-hearted if you can't name at least five people who are far from God whom you're praying for. Do you you pray for lost people? Do you pray for people that you know are far from God? Has God put a burden on your heart for some, some people who need to know Jesus? You might be hard hearted if you've lost your joy for serving the Lord. You might be hard-hearted if you spend more time sitting in a pew than serving in a ministry. You might be hard-hearted if you find yourself resisting change. You might be hard-hearted if you refuse to forgive what others have done to you to hurt you in the past. And then finally, you might be hard-hearted if you hear this message and you think of how it will apply to someone other than yourself. You see, here's the reality of it. I don't think any of us could walk out of here without hearing one of those and think, you know what, that hurts. I think every single one of us could probably be caught on a couple of those. And unfortunately, I think many of us could be caught on a lot of those. You see, here's the point. When we read that Jesus was talking to the Pharisees, if we've been in church for a long time, we automatically think, well, Pharisees bad, that's not me, I'm in church. These Pharisees were the most religious of the religious of the day. These Pharisees were the people, uh, were the people that Jesus spoke out against that angered Jesus the most. You wanna know who it was that Jesus had the most grace towards? It was those who were sinners. It was those who knew and realized that they were messed up. My fear is that that we've got hard heartedness within us. The longer you've been a follower of Jesus, Hear this, the longer you've been a follower of Jesus, the more you have to watch out for becoming hard-hearted. The more you have to watch out for becoming bitter, the more you have to watch out for being stuck in your ways. The longer you're a follower of Jesus, the longer you gotta watch out for being hard-hearted. So if, if you don't hear anything else that, 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 I hear, that I say today that comes out of my mouth, I want you to hear this church. You need to take an inventory. You need to determine whether Jesus is talking to you and if he sees this hard heartedness in your heart. I need to do the same kind of inventory. And it doesn't need to be just after this sermon. It needs to be, it needs to happen on a weekly, sometimes more than a weekly basis. Because you don't realize you're hard hearted when you're hard hearted. Secondly, the attitude that says, I want something from Jesus. Verse seven, he said this. It says that Jesus departed with his disciples. In other words, he withdrew with his disciples. He retired with his disciples. In other words, it says that he and his disciples went away to rest. They went away to take some Sabbath time. But what happened when they went away to take this this Sabbath time of rest? The crowds followed him. And what, was, what did Jesus do when the crowds followed him? He said, hey, y'all gotta come back later. Resting. Don't bother me right now. No, 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 Jesus, Jesus 
took them as they came. By the way, which, which words in the Bible are important? All of them. Listen, listen to what it said here. It said in verse uh, in verse, uh, verse, se- verse eight, it says, or verse seven and eight, it talks about the crowd who followed him. He says they were from Galilee, Judea, Jerusalem, Idumea, beyond the Jordan. That would have been, that would have been to the east and to, from Tyre and Sidon, which would have been from the north. What Mark is doing right here is he's showing that the crowd is growing, that it's getting bigger and bigger, that, that the widening of Jesus' message is getting out there. People are hearing about the things that Jesus is doing. And people from all over the world, Jews and Gentiles. In other words, the crowd that's following Jesus around is getting more and more diverse. And then in verse 8, it says they, they came and heard, they heard everything that he was doing. So they heard he was healing the sick, that he was casting out demons. So there were so many that, that there were so many there that Jesus was in danger of being crushed because they wanted to touch him. They wanted to be healed. Many, if not most of those people were coming to Jesus just because they wanted to get something from Jesus. For many of us, we come to church because we think we might be able to get something from Jesus. Maybe Jesus can heal me. Maybe Jesus can give me a better life. Maybe if I go to, maybe I, if I go to church, Jesus will be, will be happy with me. There's whole denominations that are built around this type of thinking that would say that, that Jesus, if you, if you do this or if you do that, then Jesus wants to, wants to give you more. The people would, would say something like this. Yeah, yeah, kingdom of God, sin, eternal life. That's great, that's great. Jesus, would you heal my marriage? Jesus, would you get me a new job? Jesus, would you provide this? Jesus, would you do that? And others would say, Okay, Lord, I'll get baptized if you'll save me. Jesus, I'll go to church if you'll save me. Jesus, I'll, I'll do this. I'll give my tithes. I'll give my offerings if you'll, just, if you'll just love me a little bit more, if you'll just be more happy with me. We try to stay in a right relationship with God by working for it. Can I just, can I just set you free this morning? If you, if you ever grab a hold of this, if you ever believe this, this will set you free. Jesus, you cannot make Jesus love you any more than he already loves you. Jesus already loves you perfectly. And the other thing is this, you can't make Jesus love you any less than he already loves you because Jesus loves you perfectly. Here's what, he, here's what the Bible says in Ephesians 2. He says, for you are saved by grace it, through, through faith. And he says this, and this is not of yourself. This is God's gift. Then he says it another way. He says, it's not by works so that no one can boast. We don't have to work to get anything from God. You don't have to come to church a certain number of times a year to make God happy with you. You don't have to read the Bible a certain amount of times in order to make God happy with you. You have to trust Jesus. You have to give your life to Jesus Christ. You've got to accept his gift of salvation for your sins. Trust Jesus. Find your rest in Jesus. Now, now does that mean that we don't have to go to church? Listen, let me tell you something. Does that mean we shouldn't? Does that mean we don't have to tithe? Does that mean, listen, when you love Jesus, there's a lot of things that become enjoyable that you never thought would be enjoyable. When you love Jesus, there's a lot of things that, that, that you, you want to do that nobody else would ever want to do. Give 10% to a church. Now, I don't even like the way that preacher looks. Give 10, 10% to the church. What? Man, if you'll put up with me, you gotta love Jesus. 
but you can't do anything to make Jesus love you. Some of you try so hard to be loved by others. You work so hard to be accepted by others. You work, work, work. For some of you, you get so involved in serving and, and you do it because you, do, you don't wanna hurt anybody's feelings, but we work so hard. Let me just free you up. You don't have to work for Jesus's love. You can't work for Jesus's love. Listen, that's the message that this world needs to hear. Religion destroys the false religions and the false teachings of this, of this world destroy us. Some of us have the attitude of what, what can we get from Jesus? Then in verse 13, Jesus, it says that Jesus went up on a mountain. He's about to call 12 men to be his, his, be his apostles. Now, we often think about Jesus as 12 disciples, right? Well, the, the, the truth is Jesus had lots of disciples because a disciple is a follower. It's, it's a learner. Jesus had a lot of people that were, that were kind of following him. It's like, it's like if, you're, if you're on Instagram or, or Twitter or something like that, or maybe even on, on Facebook, you, you may have lots and lots of followers, but you only have a handful that really, really keep up with you. Or you only have a handful that you really pay attention to. Well, on this particular night, Jesus went up on this mountain and Luke tells us that he went on that mountain and he prayed all night long. And when he came down, he went to all of his disciples and he called 12 guys and he called them to be apostles. An apostle is a, is a sent out one. And with those 12 guys, he, he called to a, a deeper commitment. You see, the first commitment was, listen, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. And then a lot of people started following him, some for different reasons. But then for these 12 guys, he called to a, a deeper commitment. And here was the commitment that he called them to. He says, I want you to come and I want you to be with me. Just to be with you? Yeah, I just want you to come and be with me. Be with me. The second thing he says is I want you to preach this message that you've heard me preaching. I want you to go and preach it to others. And then it says that he gave them authority to cast out demons. These 12 guys were gonna be the foundation of the church. The reason you're sitting here today is because Jesus called these 12 guys. And because these 12 guys, well, okay, with the exception of Judas, these 12 guys obeyed Jesus. Following Jesus won't be glamorous. But see, that, that, that third attitude is simple. I just want Jesus. I don't want what Jesus can give me. Is it nice to get gifts? Yeah, it is. But, but I, I don't, it's not that I want Jesus to give me all this. I just want Jesus. Maybe initially when you come to faith in Christ, you come because you're gonna have eternal life. But with Jesus, once you get to know him more and more, you realize eternal life is just the, is just the, 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 the icing on the cake because you realize that you get Jesus. But when you find that out, you find out that following Jesus, it just isn't glamorous. There's gonna be a lot of people who won't like you. You're not gonna get rich just because you know Jesus. You'll have to deny yourself. The Bible says in Luke 9, 23, deny yourself to take up your cross daily and follow him. In other words, you sacrifice when you become a follower of Jesus. You might even lose the love and respect of your family. Matthew 10, 21. You will have trouble in this world, Jesus said in, in John 16, 33. You will have trouble in this world. If you wanna be my follower, if you want to be deeply committed to me, you're going to have trouble in this world. And in Matthew 10, 16, he says this, you might even die because of me. You might even die for the name of Jesus if you want that type of relationship with Jesus. And then, and then so the disciples, so disciples, guys, what do you get out of this? We get Jesus. We get Jesus. That, what else do we need? 
Psalm 16, five says, Lord, you are my portion and my cup of blessing. You hold my future. There was this one time in John chapter six, after Jesus had, had fed this, this large group of people, like 5,000 people, and he did it with, with just a few loaves of bread and a few fish. And afterwards, he starts teaching that if, if you want satisfaction, he said, come to me, I'll satisfy you. And so all these crowds of people were coming to him and then Jesus did something crazy. He said, if you wanna be my follower, you've gotta drink my blood and eat my flesh. Now, I don't know about y'all, but that's kind of gross. And that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. But, but, and, and it didn't make a lot of sense to a lot of people. So what did they do? They, start, they started scattering. They said, I, I don't wanna be a part of that. And so Jesus asked his disciples, he said, do you guys wanna leave too? You wanna know what Peter said? Peter said, where will we go? Jesus, you hold the words of life. In other words, what Peter was saying on behalf of the 12 apostles, he said, if we leave you, we don't get you. We want you, Jesus. We want you, what you have to give us. Some of you remember getting married. Some of you have been married for so long, you don't remember when you got married, but you know you're married. Well, when you were engaged, remember, remember how in love you were? Remember that? Well, some of you may not remember that either, right? But, but you, were, you were so in love. In fact, some of you ladies thought, you know what? He completes me. He, he, make, he makes me so happy. She makes me so happy. I don't, I don't need anything else. And then the honeymoon ended. And then you realized he wasn't all he was cracked up to be. You just needed him to be a little more understanding. Honey, just be a little more sensitive to me. Could you read my mind a little better? <laughs> and then guys, you needed her to be a little more, she's perfect, who are we kidding? <laughs> but, but listen, no longer was he enough or was she enough? Or maybe it's a new job, a raise, boyfriend, a new game. You were content for a little while, but eventually the newness wore off. A lot of us treat Jesus the same way. He was enough for us back then, but we get away from him and he's no longer enough for us today. So here's the question for you today. What is your attitude toward Jesus today? Not what is your spouse's attitude? Not what is that person sitting next to you? What is his attitude? What is her attitude? What is your attitude toward Jesus? Are you hard-hearted towards him? Listen, maybe you're not a follower of Jesus Christ. Maybe you're still not sure what you wanna do with, with Jesus. You're not sure that you can believe that the, the dead being raised from, or a, a dead man rising and living again or being the son of God. But he, and here's what my prayer is for you. Ezekiel 36 says this, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will remove your heart of stone and I will give you a heart of flesh. And he says, I will place my spirit within you. Jesus is the new my prayer is that you will receive Jesus and that you will become a new creation, that you will receive a new heart and that heart of stone, that hard heart that's pushed Jesus away for so long will be broken and you'll accept his gift of salvation and know this, that he fulfills the deepest longing of your heart. There is nothing in this world that can fulfill your deepest needs the way Jesus can. So receive him. Some of you are here today who are followers of Jesus, but, but you've become hard hearted in following Jesus. You've lost your compassion. You've lost compassion for the lost. You've lost compassion for, for generations, for the generations that are younger than you. Some of you are younger and you've lost compassion for older generations. 
You've lost the mercy. You don't show that mercy and that loving towards them. You hear the word and you might even say amen when you hear, hear the word, but you walk, you walk away. You can walk away when you hear the word and not do anything with it. For some of you who are teachers of the word here today, you can teach the word week in and week out and you can walk away and not be doing the th very things that you're teaching. Listen, we, we can become hard hearted and I just want to, I want to, I want to plead with you on behalf of Jesus Christ to turn your life back over to him. That, that every single one of us, when it comes to having a, a compassionate and a merciful heart, would have the same kind of heart as a mother has. That when we see somebody in need, when we see somebody hurting, when we see somebody who's not, getting, not receiving a fair shake, that our hearts would be broken over it. And my prayer for you is that God would reignite the fire in your heart. That God would, would wake you up from your slumber. And that he would lead you in his path. Some of us here today, we just want to see what we can get for Jesus. Get from Jesus. Jesus. But I'm here to tell you today, Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. He's the Lord of the Sabbath. Come to Jesus. He says, come to me and I'll give you rest. You can find rest in me. You can quit working so hard trying to, to make everybody happy. And you can just come to me and I'll show you what it means to have rest. Or do, you want to, or do you just want Jesus? Now listen, my hunch is that every single one of us at some point in this week is gonna fall into one of those two categories. But at least as we watch this, we can see this is what I'm shooting for. I just want Jesus. If, if, if I never receive another raise, if I never, uh, if I, if I never have another child, if I never get healed from this, if, if God doesn't come through to, to help me in this way or doesn't come through the way I expect him to, I got Jesus. And may our prayer today be, Christians, listen to me. May our prayer today be, I've got Jesus. I've got Jesus. I, don't have, I may not have anything else. My life might fall apart Things may not be going my way. I may not even be hearing God in my life right now, but you know what I've got? I've got Jesus. He's the greatest thing that I could have. Today, Jesus is coming up next to you. He's putting his arm around you and he's saying, just come to me. Just come to me. Psalm 34, 8, he's saying this to you. He's saying, taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste and see that the Lord is good. He says, how happy is the person who takes refuge in Jesus. What's your attitude towards Jesus today? Would you bow with me? We're gonna pray. Father, I'm just asking for you to do right here in this place something that I could never do, no matter how hard I tried, no matter how much